Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the California Center for Environmental Law and Policy, the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and the University of California in general, I want to offer you a heartfelt welcome to this uh, Public Lands and Climate Change Symposium. Uh, my name is Rick Frank. I'm the Executive Director of the California Center for Environmental Law and Policy, and along with our uh, co-sponsors, principally the California Department of Parks uh, and Recreation. We're absolutely delighted uh, to have you here with us uh, today. Uh, the California Center for Environmental Law and Policy is a research and policy center housed within the UC Berkeley Law School. Uh, it, today's symposium in many ways reflects three key components uh, of our mission. Uh, one is a convening function to bring together uh, academics, scientists, uh, public policymakers, in this case uh, very talented public and private land managers together. Uh, second, collaboration, collaborating, uh, bringing together scholars and academic experts from around the UC Berkeley campus, the University of California system, and uh, beyond and off campus uh, as well. Uh, the collaboration here uh, today, of course, is with uh, uh, two uh, nonprofit organizations, the, the Nature Conservancy and the Resources Legacy Fund, and uh, a premier leader in the area of uh, uh, public policy we're going to be discussing today, the Department uh, of Parks and Recreation. Uh, third and finally, our center uh, is most interested, in some ways most importantly, in translating research and scholarship uh, and events of the type we're having today into tangible public policy outcomes and recommendations, and it is my hope and expectation that many of the ideas and findings that come out of this symposium today, we will be eventually able to turn into policy recommendations for implementation at the local and regional level, Sacramento, uh, the national level, and indeed uh, internationally. Uh, I'd like to introduce a few members of our center who are instrumental in making sure uh, this event uh, is a success. Uh, our associate director of the center, Simi Payne, who I think I see in the back wall, if you could wave, Simi. Uh, at the front desk, uh, 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 taking care of registration is our most able administrator, Arika Sampson. Uh, and the person who really gets uh, uh, the lion's share of the credit for go putting through all, this, uh, all the logistical details of bringing this event off and together so successfully, uh, our center event planner, Joanne Conlu. And is Joanne, are you here? She's outside in the back uh, area. If in the course of the day you have any questions, concerns, or problems, please check in with any of us and we will do our level best uh, to take care of, uh, uh, of those concerns. Um, we have a distinguished uh, group of speakers and attendees, far too many uh, to recognize by name. I would just want to, however, uh, single out three people for special mention, and uh, we're especially delighted to have with us, I believe in the front row, uh, Frank Jordan, the former mayor of San Francisco, who is uh, uh, now helping to lead the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, somewhere in the audience, maybe he could wave Byron Scher, the uh, distinguished uh, uh, State, former state senator and legislator who has been an inspiration to many of us in, in the, the uh, difficult and hugely important issues that we're going to be discussing uh, today. And finally, another one of our key partners, Mike Eaton, the executive director of the Resources Legacy Fund. And Mike, where are you? Right over here. You'll be hearing from Mike a little later today. Let me spend a moment on logistics and scheduling. We have uh, planned an exciting, full, and hopefully very informative day for you. We, are all, we were about to launch into the substantive presentations, which will take us through 11.45. We will have a short break uh, at 10.45, recognizing that in events like this, what uh, the business is conducted in the hallways and during breaks is often just as important as the formal uh, sessions. We will have uh, lunches, Bach lunches, brought in at about 11.45 uh, to here and uh, to be followed immediately by our luncheon and plenary address. Uh, we will then, beginning at 1 o'clock, resume our, uh, our presentations with a break at 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, and we will conclude those formal presentations at about 5.15. 
to assist us uh, in the morning and afternoon se uh, sessions, we have two very able facilitators who will uh, direct the dialogue, uh, uh, help the speakers uh, respond to questions, and otherwise keep the trains running on time. Let me identify and introduce them first. Uh, this morning, we will be relying in the facilitator role on Carol Hart. Carol, maybe you can uh, stand up. Uh, Carol is an attorney, uh, formerly involved with the Sonoma County Agricultural uh, Preservation uh, Trust, and is a member of the, uh, the uh, State Parks Commission and very interested in these issues. Uh, in the afternoon, we will turn the facilitator role over to someone near and dear to all of us who has really been critical in both uh, envisioning and pulling this event off, Rick Rayburn, uh, Chief of, of Natural Resources for the Department of Parks and Recreation. We will have a very short wrap up uh, at 5.15, at which time uh, the, the co-conveners, co-sponsored event will, will briefly offer some reflections and uh, maybe some suggestions of uh, a future uh, course. Uh, we want to make this event interactive as much as we possibly can, given the large crowd we have drawn. Um, uh, our facilitators are key to that process. In addition, uh, we have, you should have before you uh, a couple of comment cards, light gray cards. We very much want to hear from you to the extent we can accommodate all the interaction in the course of the question and answer period because we have a very ambitious schedule. We definitely want to get them on a real-time basis and reflected in these cards. So anytime a thought comes to you uh, in terms of a, a presentation or an idea that you think is absolutely on point and terrific or the worst idea in recent memory, uh, we want to hear about it. Let us know. Uh, and Kevin Sweeney, who is the author of the excellent uh, uh, background white paper that you got in preparation for this uh, study. Kevin, can you stand up? And his uh, research assistant, Victoria, will periodically be floating through the crowd uh, to pick up uh, those comment cards. Um, other logistics, restrooms. Uh, if you go out the door toward the registration desk, the women's restroom is to your, directly across from the registration desk uh, to your right. Men's restroom is farther down the hall uh, at the end of the corridor and to your immediate uh, left. Uh, if uh, additional facilities are needed to break, there are additional public restrooms on the first floor uh, of this uh, building. Uh, and that leads me, I would be remiss if I didn't spend just a moment talking about this fabulous facility that, uh, uh, at which we're hosting you and uh, the person who is principally responsible uh, for it. The Berkeley City Club was constructed and opened in 1930. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to explore, uh, it is uh, uh, just a, a fabulous uh, and, and, and uh, a breathtaking uh, building, uh, starting with this conference room, but that's just the beginning. So to the extent time permits, either during breaks or after the conference, I would ex encourage you to, uh, to explore. In 1977, uh, the Berkeley City Club was both uh, uh, made a, a California state landmark and placed on the National Register of Historic Places. It is the handiwork of a very noteworthy and famous architect, Julia Morgan, who was a pioneer uh, in many ways. Uh, she uh, uh, was one of the first uh, uh, graduates of the UC Berkeley Civil Engineering Program, women graduates, that is. She is also the first woman in the history of the state of California to be a state licensed architect. And happily, she has a very strong link uh, to the state park system because in addition to this treasure, she has designed uh, a number of facilities that are of, of national and world renown, including Hearst Castle in San Simeon, the, uh, the uh, center, uh, centerpiece of the state park system, the uh, crown jewel, if you will, as well as the uh, Asilomar Conference Center in uh, uh, Pacific Grove on the Monterey Peninsula, both uh, uh, overseen by the Department uh, of Parks and Recreation. So uh, we, we will be spending most of today talking about the natural environment, but uh, this is a most fitting example of the values of the human environment and the built environment, and uh, we're happy to, to can be able to convene uh, this symposium at such a breathtaking uh, site. Well, to the matter at hand, uh, climate change is without question the overarching 
environmental issue of our era. It has numerous components and one that has a, a, had been, in my view, understudy, underappreciated, but will be the focus of our attention today is, is how our conservation lands, both in public and private ownership, can be managed uh, uh, in an era uh, of climate change. And to talk about uh, the purposes and expectations specifically of this symposium today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my partner in this conference, uh, the director of the State Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Ruth Coleman. Uh, Ruth is a has, ha has had a distinguished career in state government, not just at the Department of Parks and Recreation, but as many of you know, she held a number of very important high-level staff positions in the California legislature, uh, has worked at another imp very important state agency these days, the California Air Resources Board, um, and uh, she really is one of uh, the state of California's most thoughtful and innov innovative uh, leaders. Uh, in Sacramento, on, uh, on one of the important state buildings in downtown Sacramento, perhaps reflecting a somewhat more chauvinistic time, uh, there's a phrase, give me men to match my mountains. I think maybe we can update that <laughs> phrase. Uh, uh, give us leaders to match our challenges, and I can guarantee you that our current director of Department of Parks and Recreation uh, does that. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Coleman. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here with all of you, and I want to thank so many of you to, for coming today, because I know you all have incredibly busy schedules. Um, really, the genesis of this conference began in our offices um, after the passage of Prop 84, juxtaposed with the rhetoric and the talks and the laws that Governor Schwarzenegger had passed in the whole conversation about climate change. And finally, it dawning on us that we have this money, in our case, it's about 400 million, and how are we going to spend it wisely in this context of climate change, and do we know anything to help guide us? Now, as state parks, we own a million and a half acres, so we're the largest state landowner in California. And we're constantly looking for ways to preserve these places and then to expand them and also looking for facilities. So we started asking questions like, well, should we restore the rest of the cottages at Crystal Cove? They're right kind of there on the front, on the waterfront, and it's about another 20 million to finish them. And are they going to be underwater in a few years? And then I thought, well, maybe if they're underwater in 20 years at 100% occupancy, they'll have paid for themselves anyway, so maybe that wouldn't matter. But nonetheless, it is something you have to think about. Um, the Valley Oaks. Should we be purchasing lands with valley oaks if they're not going to be here in 50 years? Should we be restoring wetlands that might be underwater? We just didn't know. And so we found in conversations with others that they didn't know either. And so we thought maybe this would be an opportunity to start having a broader conversation to find out what we can do collectively to learn more. And that's when we sought out academia. And, and we're so pleased that Berkeley's been willing to partner with us to bring the academic community together with the, the, with the people on the ground. Because as you all know about collectively, we're probably looking around $3 billion that we have amongst of us in this room between public dollars and private dollars that will be spent on conservation in the next five to seven years with the passage of various bonds and also with a substantial philanthropic commitment that, that exists in California. So how can we all spend that $3 billion effectively in a way that takes climate change into account? Because this is not a variable that in the past we at State Parks have really thought about. We have used connectivity as one of our variables, and we've been looking to connect our landscapes for a long time. But one of the questions we're starting to ask is, are our landscapes large enough? Are they connecting enough? Have we been connecting in the right direction in terms of elevation? All we have are questions. We don't have a lot of answers. And so we're really looking to academia and other individuals who have been doing research to help us answer those questions. And we figured probably a lot of the rest of you are feeling just as much in the dark as we are. Um, I don't think any of us are going to be able to, to function particularly effectively alone, and in general, we do partner, but there's a lot of barriers still to partnerships. For example, the federal laws that limit the jurisdiction of our partners, that prohibit them from being able to partner with us on land acquisition or conservation easements or other kinds of connecting um, instruments. And so we want to draw attention to some of those things that limit our ability to partner so that we can enhance that. So today, we're hoping that we will shed some more light on the subject, that we'll ask a lot of questions, 
that we will start to engage with academia so they can start answering questions. We need applied research and we need it immediately because all of us are moving very rapidly as we seek to conserve what is out there. Because California's real estate market, while it's slowed, still moves quickly, even at its slow pace. And we don't want to lose places before it's too late. And so we don't have 15 years to wait for research. We need it now. And so we really want to engage with academia and with all of you so collectively we can learn and move ahead. One of the things I've told my staff as we've been working through our own climate change initiative is this is not sort of the Baskin and Robbins flavor of the week thing. Because as park director, you often give them initiatives and they kind of roll their eyes and go, God, another flavor of the week. Here comes another idea from our director. But this is really a flavor of the century. This is an issue that needs to get into the DNA of every single citizen in the United States. This is an issue which is going to transform the entire planet. Right now, I don't believe that the public is really engaged at that visceral level that they need to be. I remember watching the, um, the Ken Burns series on World War II. And one of the things that struck me was how incredibly pervasive the notion of collectively working together towards a goal. How, that invaded, how it pervaded every single aspect of society. Children were doing victory gardens. Women, housewives were collecting all the rubber. Everybody was buying war bonds. It was an entire nation that activated within four years. Because one of the things I found so interesting was that when we were bombed by Pearl Harbor, a lot of our military was still on horseback. We had a very large cavalry in those days. So imagine that transformation in four years of where we went. That is not what's happening yet in our country. People are not yet connecting to this and seeing that they have a personal investment. And I think some of the work that we do gives us an opportunity to start communicating that to the public in a way that they'll start to respond and it'll eventually get into the core of their DNA. But for now, it's up to us to get it into our own DNA and that's really what today is about. I think it's fitting that we're in a Julia Morgan building. She made a place of exquisite beauty and yet you are surrounded by reinforced steel and concrete. She survived the 1906 earthquake, and every building she built after that was built to withstand it. And I can tell you when there was an earthquake right centered at Hearst Castle, nothing cracked. It was extraordinary. And that's the case here. She's built a place of beauty that is built to last. Now, we all preserve places of beauty, and we protect and we restore places of beauty. And so the question for us today is, can we create these places in a way that they will last? And that's really what today is all about, is how do we focus our energies collectively so that we have places that last through these changes that are hitting us so fast, faster than our ability to really understand them. So again, I want to thank you all for coming. We are really honored at State Parks to be hosting this and to be partnering with Berkeley and with uh, uh, Nature Conservancy has also helped us in Resources Law Group. Resources Law Fund, I always confuse which one it is, but... Um, that the, these, our partners, we're bringing to you today, we hope, an opportunity to learn and to meet each other and to start identifying ways to learn more after today. So um, with that, we're going to turn it on over to the proceedings. I hope you all have a really open mind and we all look for this as an opportunity to learn from each other and to prod academia to start generating some information that we can all use. Thank you. We're starting out uh, appropriately talking about climate change and impacts to California habitat and wildlife. Our first speaker is March, Mark Hashofsky, Senior Environmental Scientist of uh, the California Department of Fish and Game. There he is. I'm gonna just do a brief intro. <clears throat> uh, Mark is an ecologist with degrees in biology and geology. He's worked with uh, Fish and Game since 1986. During that time, he coordinated the department's statewide significant natural program, helped develop and staff the California Biodiversity Council and the California Legacy Project, <clears throat> served as an advisor for several statewide reports on the state's biodiversity, co-authored California State Wildlife Plan, and co-edited Invasive Plants of California Wildlands. He currently provides state-level policy guidance for several regional conservation plans natural community conservation plans throughout California and is also developing a statewide effort to assess habitat connectivity in conjunction with Caltrans, State Parks, University of California, and others. <clears throat> he also serves as the DFG representative on the Joint Agency Climate Team, or did from 2001 to 2003, ensuring that the state wildlife plan included climate change 
and develop this presentation that you're going to see for California's natural resource professionals to raise their awareness of ecological impacts from climate change. Mark, with that. That was a longer introduction than I expected. Thank you. Um, let's see. How's this? I need some technical support up here to get my talk going. Um, I'm going to be giving you an, an overview of um, climate change, uh, what's likely to um, be the physical uh, environment changes, and then what are some ecological responses, and how that relates to the work that we do. This is a talk that um, was um, funded, um, we, I developed this with the California Energy Commission, the Public Energy Interest uh, Research Program. Uh, Guido Franco's down here in the audience, um, and they were able to bring in some other um, people to help me put this talk together. So the key points that I wanted to um, make is that the climate in California is already rapidly changing. We can express, expect greater stress on species and habitats. And these species and habitats are going to respond in different and perhaps surprising ways, but we can take some action now to help them adapt and survive. That's the main message I want to deliver here. The temperature, let me talk about just, just so we're all on the same page about climate change. California's temperature has already been warming over the last 50 years, and it's warming in different places. Some places are warming faster than others. Um, the graph on the right shows the changes in Los Angeles temperature trend over the last hundred years gradually increasing. On a broader scale, this is the northern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere has been warming. Um, it's warmer now than it has been over the last 1,300 years. Uh, the flat line, where'd my little, there we go. The, Flat line here is the mean average temperature 19, from 1961 to 1990. So you can see over the previous 1,300 years, it was below that, and now we're having this uh, tremendous spike in the recent years. And that warming is due to increased greenhouse gases. And I want to point out um, that part of this talk is I'm trying to bring this, this topic down specifically to California and specifically to natural resources. And for California, um, people talk about lots of different sources of greenhouse gases. In California, 41% of our greenhouse gases come from transportation. And most of that is from gasoline burned in light duty vehicles. And I want to point that out because it has two implications. One, it's a personal choice about every time we get behind a car, we should be thinking about that. Um, get behind the wheel of a car. The other is that it makes implications for land use planning. Our, our, uh, the land use in this state has been designed around cars, and to reduce our carbon footprint, we have to figure out how to deal with that existing infrastructure. Uh, so that's really where the, the change needs to happen. In our work in natural resource professionals, we're, that's not our job. We're, our job is really focusing on natural resources and the responses to that, but that's the, the context that we need to think about. So, How's the temperature likely to change in the future? And this is really going to depend on our choices. Um, there, uh, if we continue to do rapid fossil fuel intensive growth, we're going to have high emissions of greenhouse gases. We can seek, um, get moderate levels if we do a primarily fossil fuel dependent growth or in some green technology. And the lowest emissions will be if we shift to a service and information economy with lots more green technology. The, uh, color coding is, I'm going to be using this uh, throughout this talk here, the bright red, the mean high emissions, the orange, the moderate, and the green is the, the lowest emissions. This is a graph uh, showing what is likely to happen with the temperature in the future. The highest emissions are above this line. There's several different models. These are all global climate change models predicting different kinds of temperatures. Um, but there's um, several models that reach up into the higher emissions. There's several that are in medium emissions and here in the lowest. But you see that they're all going to be changing. Um, even at the lowest emissions, we'll be continuing to have warming. Another factor that people have talked about is 
precipitation. What's likely to happen with precipitation? Um, the models are really uncertain about this, and it doesn't really show much change um, in, this is from Northern California, not much significant change in precipitation, uh, the annual mean precipitation. Um, so let me talk about the expected physical impacts. There's going to be three, um, three fa facts and uh, impacts that I think you need to, to bear in mind. I'm trying to keep this simple down, just you know, do three of these and four of these type of thing. Three of them is um, even though the, temp the precipitation, the mean annual precipitation is unlikely to change, with an increase in temperature, we're going to actually have greater seasonality in precipitation and the type of precipitation that we get. We're going to be getting less winter snow in the mountains, and we're likely to have more summer drought. It's also with increasing temperatures, uh, we're going to have a, a greater risk of large wildfires, and there's going to be increase in sea level rise. So I'm going to go through those uh, three uh, in a little more detail. This is a chart that shows how those different uh, physical fact, in, impacts are going to happen, uh, change with the different emission levels. You can see over here, this is the high emission, medium, and low emissions. This is the likely temperature cha uh, change over the next 100 years. For the Sierra snowpack, at the, even at the lowest emissions, we're talking about a 30 to 60 percent loss in snowpack, which could, at high emissions, we can go up to 90 percent loss. The number of critically dry years can go from you know, a slight increase to two and a half times as often. Large, wild, uh, large fire risk can increase up to 55 percent. And sea level rise uh, can go from six to 33 inches. Um, those ranges can actually vary. There's a lot of different models. There, I mean, people are talking about 10-foot rises, but I haven't really seen anything real clear on that. So I'm going to stick with the, the three-foot thing. So snow. What's, why snow, uh, less snowpack such a problem? Uh, most of California's water depends on snow. This is a map of the U.S. which shows the um, amount, the fraction of the annual precipitation that falls as, um, here's my little graph. Either it's mostly snow, which is the light colors, to mostly rain, which is the dark colors. And you can see that on the uh, west coast here, most of our precipitation falls as snow throughout the year. The snowpack is already reducing in the Sierra. These are some photographs uh, 100 years apart of uh, glaciers in the Sierra. This is Dana Glacier from 1883, and this is in 2004. You can see a great loss of ice in these areas. This is the Darwin Glacier in 1908 and 2004. Again, more losses of the snow, the, the ice from the glacier. Oh, oh sorry, click the button here. Let me see if I was done with that one. Yeah. This uh, snowpack is likely to continue to increase and continue to shrink. These are, um, uh, the colors here are the snow water equivalent in inches in April 1, and it, uh, the historical average, 1961 to 1990, this is where we are right now. You can see under a lower warming range and a medium warming range, we could have the 20% loss in snowpack. What does that really mean? Well, it's gonna mean a lot less water storage as snow. This is a graph from DWR showing in million acre foot the amount of storage, water storage, we currently get from San Joaquin Valley Reservoirs cumulatively, the Sacramento Valley Reservoirs, and the Sierra Snowpack. Sierra Snowpack is equal to all the reservoirs in the Sacramento Valley. With uh, a reduction in losses, we could have five million acre feet lost. So we have less water to go around for people and for wildlife. Likely to have more winter flooding, um, more winter runoff and flooding. If that's the storms that come in in the wintertime, it comes down as snow and just stays there. And then it waits until it warms up and gradually releases. If it's coming in as rain, it's going to pour right, right off. These are um, some models in terms of the amount of runoff in, 
after a storm event in terms of hours. This is our base case with the blue line. What it typically does, it kind of spikes a little bit and drops down. With a five degree increase, we could have substantial spikes here and more flooding during the winter, during the winter time. So what are the, the ecological impacts of snowpack um, loss? We can expect more violent winter flooding. It's, it could be more increased riparian erosion. All the riparian work we're doing, how are we going to prepare for those greater flooding events during the winter? There's going to be, and there already have been, calls for more water storage and uh, flood control. And we can expect less water for species and water-dependent habitats like rivers and wetlands. So we need to consider things, and these are some ideas. I've thrown in some ideas about what we should be considering in our planning and decision making. Thinking about wider floodplains, we've been calling out for that for a long time, but uh, this is another good case for it. Meander belts and some more creative water storage ideas. So the second element, fire risk. Fire risk is already increasing. Um, this is a graph from uh, 1970 to 2000. In red, uh, in, in black, is the temperature, average uh, temperature during the spring and summer, and the red is the um, wildfire frequency, and it parallels temperature very closely. So as temperatures tend to increase, the wildfire frequency increases. Fire is likely to continue to increase. These are um, similar graphs I talked about before. This is the probability of large wildfire from a very um, tan color out to a red. Historical average, 1961 to 1990, is what it looks like. Under a medium warming range, we could have 55% increase in the frequency of wildfires. So the ecological links with wildfire is expecting more frequent large wildfires, longer wildfire seasons. There's likely to be changes in vegetation types and the distribution. Some of the global modeling on vegetation modeling has suggested there's going to be more shrublands and less forest. We need to consider ideas about reducing fuel loads. And there's, of course, limits on prescribed burning related to air quality and those issues. So how are we going to deal with that um, fire risk? The third element is sea level rising. Uh, it's already rising. This is a graph at um, the Golden Gate um, Bridge of sea level rise over the last 100 years. It's risen eight inches already. This is not a, these impacts are not something that's going to happen in 100 years. These are already happening now. It's going to continue to increase. We can expect 12 to 36 inch rise uh, by 2100. These are the um, different emission scenarios with uh, ranges of confidence about where that could be. What does that mean? What does a three foot elevation rise in sea level really mean for California? Um, if you look at the lands that are less than three feet above sea level in central California, they are all the blue areas up there. If sea level rises, all of that uh, delta area becomes an extension of the San Francisco Bay. Also on sea level rise, where are these coastal wetlands going to go? This is a era photo of Newport Bay. And here is the wetland area. And these are the houses right next to it. You rise sea level three feet, where is one of the best wetlands in Southern California going to go? There's no room. So the ecological impacts to think about for the sea level rise. Expect permanent marine flooding of low-lying areas. We're already hearing calls for alternative delta water transfer, the peripheral canal. Expect less, much less fresh water in the delta. And there's going to be this upslope migration of the coastal urban areas into places. We already have that, that expansion of urban areas, but there'll be an accelerated need for that to move houses someplace else, further upslope. So considering, what do we need to consider? We need to consider how to protect upslope areas around coastal habitats. And this is going to be a real tough one for us, because if you look just above some of those wetlands, it's just farmland. It's grass. It's like, why am I going to spend my you know, limited money buying a bunch of farmland? There's no habitat value there. But that's within that three foot rise above the, the wetland. This is going to be real hard decisions for us to think about. And we may need to re rely less on terrestrial reserves in low-lying areas. How do we factor that in? 
So let me talk about ecological responses to those. That the three, the three uh, physical things I was talking about then was um, the changes in snowpack, the fire, and the sea level rise. The kind of um, ecological responses that are going to be happening, we're going to have earlier spring events. This is a phenology you may have heard about. I'll go into more details on each of these as I go along. We'll have species shifting to cooler areas. We're going to have habitat type shifts, changes in the amount of different types and the distribution. And we're going to have different responses by different species that's going to make things really complicated for us. So spring events. Spring events are already occurring earlier. They've, in the last 30 years, um, there was a project that Terry Root did to look at 130 different birds, plants, and insect species, looking at flowering, when they first flowered, when the insects first emerged, when the migratory birds first arrived. And there has been, over the last 30 years, a decrease in the day. Basically, this is earlier each year, um, towards um, in, earlier in the spring, at about three days a decade. Uh, it's a, going earlier. So this is, this is not in the future, this has already been happening. Some of the early examples for California, uh, another project, there were uh, 22 bird species in which there was su sufficient data available. 55% uh, of those 22 species showed a change in their um, spring events. But there were different responses by different species. So seven of them arrived earlier, but two arrived later over a long period of time. Uh, there were four species with a strong link to temperature, and here's the examples of them. But not everything is moving earlier, is a, is a, is a message here. There are likely to be shifts to cooler areas, and uh, Craig Morris is here, he'll be talking later um, about the Grinnell survey. And I just sort of uh, shortened some of his, uh, into this graphic here. Um, back in uh, at the turn of the century, Grinnell did a great survey of um, species around the state. We've, uh, Craig and, and his team have uh, led up a, a new resurvey of that, fairly detailed, and they've seen um, some shifts of small mammals. Uh, there were five high elevation species whose lower elevation range from 100 years ago has shifted upwards 2,000 feet already. There are several other species, four lower elevation species, whose lower distribution has shifted up 1,700 feet in the last 100 years. But again, thinking of the surprises, there are several species who have actually decreased, have dropped their elevation. They are now found at lower elevations than they were before. So we're gonna have different species with different responses. This is an example of one of the species, a pinion mouse, that um, at the turn of the century was found in the pinion juniper woodland of this kind of habitat at around 8,000 feet, is now being found up in Lodgepole and Whitebark Pine at over 10,000 feet. Another element, these habitat shifts in amount and location. This is um, some work looking at um, global, or region, broad scale vegetation shifts, so it's fairly coarse. Um, but it shows there, there are likely to be um, shifts in the amount of, in, in the distribution of habitat if you look at the um, area down here on the south coast, you see a lot of the brown, which is the shrubland. But uh, under this B1 modeling scenario, there's going to be a lot less shrubland in that area. Um, you see the blue up here is alpine and subalpine. There's going to be a lot less of that in the Sierra. Up in the Modoc, you see a lot of shrubland up in here. It's breaking up and getting more into uh, more forest more grasslands. These are modeling, but it gives an indication there could be some changes, significant changes ahead of us. This is the work that Lee Hanna, uh, Lydia Rees is here, she's gonna talk, maybe, she may not talk about it today, but she's been involved in this project too. Looking, they, they're modeling 300 different uh, trees and shrubs around California, looking at their current um, climatic envelope, what, are they, what climate do they grow, grow under right now, and where would that climate be in 100 years? So where would those species be? This is an example from that work about blue oak. The red shows where the species is no longer be, gonna be found because the climate is unsuitable. The green is a species gain. They're gonna be moving into it because the climate now is gonna be suitable in 100 years. 
you'll see that there's a lot losses of blue oaks out in the coast range, the lower slopes of the, the Sierra, and there's this ups, upward slope movement of Sierra uh, in the Sierra blue oak. It's likely to be. <coughs> it's likely to be changes in the amount of habitat types. This is um, the um, percent change expected by under different uh, emission scenarios. You'll see that we'll be having uh, significant losses of alpine, subalpine habitat, evergreen conifer forest, and mixed evergreen woodland, whereas there'll be increases in grassland and, and mixed evergreen forest. So it's um, like a statewide uh, calculation of the amounts that would persist if the, you know, the climate's shifting and the, where they can move to. Another message is there's different species with different responses. Um, we can expect that we're gonna have more habitat generalists. Those are the species that are gonna be able to adapt and accommodate these changes very readily. That includes invasive species, insects, and pathogens. They do real well with a lot of different types of environments. Those that are more uh, restricted in their habitats will probably suffer a lot. There's likely to be greater survival of heat tolerant species, those that have a wide range of tolerant, uh, temperature tolerances. There can be mismatches in the timing or the distribution among species. So think about it, pollinators and flowers. If the flowers are open at the wrong time and the pollinators haven't arrived to migrate, what's gonna happen? Um, the insectivores, um, thinking about riparian, um, Neotropical migrants coming in and um, their hatching of insect prey. And all of these, these different, different species are acting different ways. Uh, how is that going to affect ecosystem functioning? There's a lot of unknowns here. Moving is likely to be difficult or impossible for some of these species. For those species that live on hilltops or mountaintops, there's no room upslope. Uh, some of them will have impassable migration routes in terms of where our roads and, and cities have been built. Climate warming can be uh, happening faster than trees could relocate. And some of the new areas may be really unsuitable for other reasons. Could be the wrong soil type, no symbiotic species present, high competition from exotic species there. There will be some challenges for moving to these new areas. So what do we do? Well, the most important action is really reduce greenhouse gases. Um, but that's, uh, for, for natural resource professionals, we need to think about reducing existing stressors on species and buying time for species to adapt. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I'm going behind time here. So we need to reduce existing stressors. These are some of the stressors. And if you look at our uh, California State Wildlife Action Plan, you'll see a lot of these expressed in there. There's some good recommendations in there for how to reduce stressors on wildlife. We need to plan for climate sensitive species. Those are species with limited dispersal ability, slow reproductive rates, a very specific habitat or soil requirements. We need to think about those populations that are located on habitat islands. Um, how can they move to a new climate area? Uh, those species that are near the limits of physical, physiological tolerance or at range extremes. We need to buy more time for species to adapt. Um, setting up more larger reserves with this uh, topographic heterogeneity. And this is something that we're doing with our natural community conservation plans, joint ventures, a number of other projects. I know you guys are involved in these. Thinking bigger. Um, we need to provide room for these uh, species for northward and upward slope movement, maintain a high species diversity, representing habitat types across environmental gradients. We need to keep, uh, keep up the work that we've been doing on habitat linkages so that they can, these species can move to new locations and reduce fragmentation. These are things we're already doing. So I wanted us to recognize that this is not an impossible task. We're already making progress this way. We need to keep doing this. This is more justification for us to do what we have been doing. We just need to put on top of that a little more creative thinking about um, those species and habitats are more sensitive. Restoration of habitat courses something we do, we need to think about species or genotypes that are more resistant or resilient to climate extremes. We need to focus on the northern ex edge of the range or higher ground. Um, controlling invasive species, we've been doing that, we need to do more of that. Assisted migration is a really uh, controversial one. 
This is, well, do you actually pick up the species? If they can't move fast enough, do you pick them up and put them in the new location and hope they're going to grow? Well, gosh, there's all kinds of policy implications with that. Uh, you guys can imagine that one. So just to wrap up, key points to remember, the climate is already changing. This is not out in the future 100 years or so. This is happening now. Um, there's going to be greater, we already have species that are under a lot of stress. They're going to be under even more stress. That the species and the habitats are going to respond in different, very surprising ways at times. So it's going to be hard to predict. We need to have a lot of flexibility and figure out how to accommodate as many options as possible. But we can take some action now to help them adapt and survive. Thank you. Right, so we have about uh, maybe around 10 minutes for questions for Mark. Um, if there are some questions, you could just raise your hand. I think we have a microphone. Do you have a microphone? Is that the plan? Yeah. Or you can, I can, we can hear it, yeah. Uh, just to clarify, so yeah, I can comment on that. <clears throat> I was going to mention that. Uh, after we had an absolute confirmation, but, oh, you have the mic, Rick's got the mic. So, oh, the question is, uh, will the presentations and the, everything that you hear today be available on the website? And the answer is yes. We're going to send emails, but the website that we sent out to everyone that had the password, <clears throat> we're going to continue to have that up, except I guess we won't have the password so that it'll be available to everyone in the general public. And all of these presentations will be there. And I know that we're having podcast available of it too, but we'll send you an email and confirm that. Yes. Uh, thank you. You laid out the problem very well. You laid out the solutions very well. Uh, what does it take and what kind of process do you see happening in the state of California as far as coming up with a concrete plan that integrates all this thinking and then trying to see it sort of adopted so you could then turn around and implement it. Is that something that would be in the state wildlife action plan or how does it work? Well, I think that's, um, I, I think that's something we really need to put a lot of heads together on because there's a lot of uncertainty. As Ruth was talking about, we need academic community to really help answer some of these things. We're, we're giving you a range of probabilities of this is likely to happen, this is may happen, and the, the vegetation shifts. So that's like a global thing. How do you know what's gonna happen like right outside the door here? You don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. But there's also a lot of creative thinking of people uh, in this room and in the agencies. Um, I don't really know what would um, be the best solution, but I would like to see some more concerted workshops of getting those thinking heads together and figuring out you know, taking on one or two or some integrative kind of approach to lay out some solutions. Hi. Are you aware of any um, agencies or um, acquisitions or restorations that are about to occur, occur or are occurring that are looking at some of these factors and making decisions about you know, how the project proceeds? Um, there's lots of people in this room, I'm sure, that have lots of ideas. One that occurs to me uh, right off the head is, off the top is that um, there are a number of natural community conservation plans, countywide regional plans, in, uh, that overlap the Delta. Um, Yolano, Solano County, South Sacramento. Um, those counties, local government is already saying, hey, we're gonna have sea level rise, and this delta could be inundated. Why should we be directing mitigation and conservation into those low-lying areas if they're gonna be flooded? So they're already thinking about how they should be maybe directing the conservation above the three-foot level. This is one example. Hi, are you, uh, are you aware of any statewide efforts to identify uh, areas, natural systems that would be vulnerable to both the effects of CO2, r rises in CO2 levels, and nitrification? No, I'm, I'm not aware of that. The only thing that, that would be close to that is what Lee Hanna is doing in Santa Barbara to look at, as I showed an example, the, um, um, 
species shifting to new locations with new climate, and they looked at 300, they're looking at 300 different species. They're also looking at more dynamic models, trying to figure in fire modeling and others, but no, I'm not aware of uh, anything else that's going on. I'm sure the people in this room may know something. I wanted to mention, uh, Mark, that uh, in answer to the previous question, that in San Francisco Bay, uh, the restoration of the salt ponds is proceeding with uh, looking at uh, sediment requirements. The, the bay is sediment starved. Uh, the wetlands are subsided already. And as they convert to tidal marsh, it will require substantial amount of sediment. It's being done uh, in adaptive management context, uh, not all at once. And uh, USGS is developing models of, uh, for a sediment budget and also how sediment moves. A critical factor in the bay is, is a lot of the sediment could come from the mud flats, which are also essential uh, habitat uh, for migratory birds. So uh, it, a lot of what we're doing, I think, needs to be done in an adaptive management context. And one other thing, Mark, you uh, talked a lot about averages and trends, and uh, there's another um, phenomenon, that is th uh, state changes or threshold, thresholds that are caused, nonlinear responses to climate change that can surprise us. And maybe you could address uh, that. I wish I could, but I, I'm not really familiar with it. So um, this is, my, my involvement in climate change I think is fairly limited actually. I put this presentation together because I felt the natural resource professionals were not aware of it. So I've, I'm just sort of cutting the very top of the surface. I'm not involved in professionally in climate change. Um, so I can't really, I, I'm not really up on those models. I was just thinking that it might be helpful to say who you are when you ask a question and so that people, if they want to follow up with you, they could later on. Do we still have time? Yeah, are there any more questions? We have a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, Ruskin Hartley with Save the Redwoods League. I think the, the most interesting fact you, you, you presented there was the sort of 41% of emissions that came from light vehicle traffic, which is a kind of direct result of the land use patterns that we have in California. And it would seem that the intersection of those land use patterns and those broader scales of the changes we're looking at seems to be where part of the solution lies and maybe part of the challenge to, to develop a, an integrated land use policy for the state that considers where the people are living as part of the solution to the greenhouse gas problem <laughs> and as part of the solution to creating a network of places that, that live together. So I guess the question is, are we, is that dialogue happening? Is that dialogue happening between Fish and Game and those other agencies that are responsible for broader land use policy? Well, the, the Energy Commission just recently released a report through the peer program, right, Guido, about land use and energy related to climate change. Um, so they're starting to talk about that link. I understand the Air Board has been talking about having a symposium related to climate change and land use planning. But there'll be some real challenges. I mean, we have this, this physical infrastructure that's there and you just can't sort of erase it and do something nicer, you know? You gotta live with what you've got and modify it, tweak it around the edges, otherwise, well, I don't know how else you do it. Uh, Jim Baxter from Sacramento State University. Um, I'd like to just piggyback on an earlier question. Uh, and I know, you know this wasn't exactly, you know, your, your, your mission today was to address this issue, but I, I guess it's sort of, in that respect, a broader question. Um, there's, it, it's very important, obviously, to bring together um, scientists and uh, policy folks, uh, parks and, and, and folks that are managing public lands. I, I'm curious how we're going to move, you know, on some of these issues uh, unless we have a broad outreach to the general public for, you know, to get public support for, for these kinds of efforts. Uh, I think the, the public is primed for that, but, but these are very complex issues. As a scientist, I understand the challenges of communicating um, these, these complexities and, and, you know, where we're going. And I, I'd just like to, um, you know, implore all of us to think about how we're going to 
really get public buy-in um, for moving forward on this, it's going to be very costly. And, and, and as Ruth Coleman pointed out, I think, you know, it's going to really take a collective effort, and that collective effort um, really, you know, intrinsically is going to be the whole of us, you know, the, the power of one people working together to really try solve this problem. There's, there's already been a lot of, um, I, I've seen a, a, a sea change in the last year, actually, since AB32 came out and Al Gore's movie came out. I actually put this presentation together because when I was working on the State Wildlife Plan uh, two years ago, sent it out for a review, I included climate change as one of the stressors in wildlife. And when I sent out the review to natural resource professionals, I was astounded at the responses I got. Responses are, it's not going to happen for 100 years, why worry about it? Or, what does this have to do with wildlife? This is just two years ago. And already I'm seeing a shift. People are getting it. They're starting to see things are happening. So this, this dialogue is happening. We do need to have that more public outreach. I agree with you. Craig Murch, UC Berkeley. First of all, thank you for the lovely slides. I may borrow them. Sure. Um, you mentioned that perhaps ecological restoration should focus on on the species that are more resilient, and implicit in that is perhaps uh, some element of triage. And I was wondering if you think the legal framework is there from the perspective of fish and game to allow for triage, or are you compelled to keep going to the very last ditch on, on threatened Oh yeah, species? that's a policy question. I don't know if I can really handle that uh, very well. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, we do make decisions all the time. We have so many listed endangered species in this state already and not enough resources to do it. So we're already making decisions along those lines. So, yeah, there's going to be some of that. But I, I really can't respond about what the department would want to do on that. Uh, just some tangible evidence that this is something that we're thinking about and is possibility. I'm James Bernard from the Mendocino Land Trust. We hold on one of our coastal prairie properties habitat suitable for an endangered butterfly, and its population is centered in a state park 40 miles south. And we are ripe for assisted migration. But we have done a dance with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over funding and come up short. So I'm using our case as a, an illustration of what is possible, but that we must start now. Um, Byron, Chair, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, billions of dollars that the voters have approved for uh, acquisitions, uh, which the legislature will be appropriating. Do you know whether the Department of Fish and Game or other state agencies will be actively participating in the appropriation process and bringing to bear these considerations which you have outlined that uh, we ought to be taking into account and in how we spend that money? I'd love to answer that one, but I think there's some other fish and game people here. That is Kevin hunting here? Sandy Mori? Do you want to? No? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Can't, can't handle that one, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. announcements before we go on. If you have a vacant seat next to you, we have some people in the back who are looking to find seats, so if you have a vacant seat, if you could raise your hand, and you will make a new best friend today. All right. Second, if you have uh, pagers or cell phones, please either turn them off or put them on vibrate mode. Thank you. All right. I just have a couple things I'd like to say. You know, uh, just briefly, Mark mentioned, uh, or I can't, I think you mentioned the peer program, but I would really recommend everyone look online at the California Climate Change uh, Center site because they're all, uh, it's a great way to access a lot of the research on climate change, a lot of the cutting edge research that's being done in, in the state. And I know I use a lot for my work. And also the other thing is with regard to Senator Scheer's question, I think that's our job here today is to make sure that all of uh, the inf this information is included in the way the money is spent from the bonds, whether it's through fish and game or parks or conservancies or whoever. 
Um, all right, so our next speaker is going to, our next two speakers, actually, we're going to have a, kind of a really great conversation now about what's going on in the Bay and California coast. Our next two speakers are Will Travis, Executive Director of um, BCDC, um, Bay Conservation and Development Commission, and Sam Shuckett, um, Executive Director of California Coastal Conservancy. So first, I guess, uh, Will is going to come up and present his excellent PowerPoint, which I uh, was able to see. Um, just briefly, Will was uh, staffed to the California Coastal Commission for many years. He came back to BCDC in 1985, took over executive director in 1985, and has, among many notable things, he spearheaded the acquisition of 10,000 acres of privately owned salt ponds along the northern shoreline of, actually it's a southern shoreline, isn't it? Of San Francisco Bay. Somebody's trying to trick me with my notes. <laughs> All right, so first we're going to hear from Will, and then Sam, and then we'll have some Q&A. Thank It's always lousy to be between an audience and a break. And it was the northern shoreline of San Francisco Bay. Yep, There's two big ones. Uh, this is San Francisco Bay today. It's what you're seeing there is about a third smaller than what the bay looked like at the time of the California gold rush. The bay got smaller for a simple reason. It's quite shallow. So a lot of it was filled. This, by the way, is the Berkeley waterfront. And there were plans to fill a lot more of the bay. In 1959, our friends at the United States Army Corps of Engineers prepared a map in which they showed that 60% of the remaining bay was shallow enough to fill. This is the shoreline of the bay in 1849. This is where it was in 1959. The Corps said it could be out here. The Corps' client was the United States Department of Commerce, and the purpose of the report was to show the economic benefits to the region of continuing to fill the bay. Well, when this map appeared in the newspapers, people in the Bay Area looked at it and said, you know what, we like living next to the bay we don't want to live next to the San Francisco pretty wide river. So they revolted and led by three women from associated with the UC Berkeley, uh, they got legislation passed that set up BCDC, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And our job is primarily to keep the bay from getting smaller by regulating landfill projects. And we've done that. And in fact, over the past four decades through wetland restoration projects, the bay has actually gotten larger. So, <laughs> I, I like to say that BCDC is in that elite group of government agencies that actually knows what it's supposed to do and does it. So at this point, we would love to just say, mission accomplished and go home. But as we all know, sometimes things happen and we aren't quite done. <laughs> I have scoured lots of scientific reports to document global warming. And although some people still find the truth inconvenient and unwanted, there is evidence of global warming everywhere. <laughs> now, one of the most well-known repercussions of global warming is sea level rise. And Mark has already told you about what's happened in San Francisco Bay. So we show this uh, slide and point out that uh, the water levels in the bay have gone up. We know that because the oldest continuously operating tide gauge in the United States of America is at the Golden Gate. We have 140 years of data. 
So we always point out on this slide, the important thing to look at is not that the line is going up, but that the legend underneath is the 20th century. It is already happening. So if you still encounter people who say that global warming and sea level rise is a hypothesis, it is a theory, advise them, please turn off your AM talk radio and go to the history section of the library because you will find the evidence there. Now, as Mark also explained, uh, there are three different scenarios that we're looking at for what happens with temperatures. And depending on how much we're able to control greenhouse gases, and when I say we, I mean we, species, homo sapien, planet Earth. This isn't just the Bay Area or California. This means everybody. If we're able to really, really control things, we're looking at about three degrees Fahrenheit rise. On the other hand, if business as usual continues, we're looking at about 10 and a half degrees. Mark also showed you this. If we allow things to continue as usual, we're looking at about a meter of sea level rise. So we ask our guys, well, what does a meter sea level rise look like in San Francisco Bay? And they said, well, here, we'll put it in the GIS system. We'll give you two maps. One shows that what the bay looked like in 1849, the other what it will look like in 2100, and as you see, they look pretty much the same. So the good news is all that area that we lost to filling in the first half century after California became a state, we get back and it becomes part of the bay. The bad news is we have built all kinds of expensive stuff on that low-lying filled land, stuff that is absolutely essential to civilization as we know it. Let me give you a couple of examples. The dark blue is where the bay is now. The light blue is one meter of sea level rise. This is San Francisco International Airport. The message, fly Oakland. <laughs> Not so fast. This is Oakland International Airport. And this is Silicon Valley, which faces a double jeopardy of both sea level rise and subsiding ground level elevations. Now, over the next century, the bay is going to slowly fill with water like a bathtub, but we can't wait a century to deal with this problem because the scientists tell us that in addition to sea level rise, we're going to be facing more volatility in our climate. We'll have more intense storms, we will have them more often. A storm surge is what happens when you have the unfortunate coincidence of a heavy rain coming on top of a high tide with wind pushing the water across the bay. And the scientists tell us that the sorts of storm surge events that we experience once a century in the past, we will experience 10 times as often. Mark has also told you that one of the other things we're facing is extended droughts, higher temperatures, more wildfires like we've experienced in California. What are we doing about this? Well, we're building out there in what we call the urban wildland interface. So instead of just having forest fires, we're going to have building fires. Now, as the old TV commercial used to say, wait, there's more. With more rain falling, uh, more precipitation falling as rain, less as snow, we are going to have more fresh water coming into the bay during the winter and less of it coming in the spring and summer. And that is going to allow these salty areas, which are shown here in the oranges and reds, to get farther up into the delta than they do now. Now, as all of you know, the delta is where there are those great big pumps. Californians will not like it when they bend over the water fountain and get a mouthful of salty water. So what should we do about this? I think the first thing we have to do is that we are in much the same position as the captain of the Titanic was. By the time he looked up and saw the iceberg, at the speed he was going, it, he was going to hit it. It was inevitable. There was nothing he could do. 
We are in the position that if today all of us everywhere turn off the lights, park our cars, and mothball all the power plants, there's so much greenhouse gas in the atmosphere that it's going to continue to get warmer for at least another three to four decades. So we will have to change the way we store, move, and use water in California. We need to make sure the public is aware of this problem and what they can do about it. Now, fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. We've got some help. You've heard the story about Al Gore getting the Nobel Peace Prize and sharing it equally with the scientists that are in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There are so many scientists involved, and they have such a high confidence in climate change that when they shared the prize equally, Al Gore got $750,000, and each of them got a Starbucks latte. <laughs> so Al Gore has made global warming into a global problem. What we are hoping as a small regional agency, that the maps that we're producing showing the impacts of sea level rise on the Bay will bring home the message that global warming isn't just a problem for penguins in Antarctica and polar bears in Alaska. It's going to have profound impacts here in our region, something that we have to do something about now. Now, the challenges posed by climate change have already had a profound impact on governance here in the Bay Area. And let me explain how this came about. The air for which the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has responsibility is getting warmer. That means the Bay, which is under the purview of BCDC, is getting bigger. That bigger bay is going to flood lots of transportation infrastructure that is being planned and financed by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And it will also flood homes and businesses that the Association of Bay Area Governments is planning. So we are working together. The four agencies are working under something called a joint policy committee because we realized that none of us can do our jobs independently anymore. We have to work together. My 16-year-old daughter describes this profound governmental conclusion as, duh. <laughs> the next thing we need to do is prepare a new plan for our region. We need a plan that anticipates the impacts of climate change and helps us be ready to adapt to those impacts when they occur. Clearly, we can't allow our cities to go underwater. So we're gonna have to build levees, lots of levees. Now, we face a double challenge in building our levees. We have to build them so that they're high enough and strong enough to stand up to rising seas and storm surges, and they have to be able to do it during an earthquake. We will build levees around our airports. We don't have any choice. It turns out that that's really not such a big deal. If you fly into Amsterdam now, when your plane touches down, the wheels are several feet below sea level. Now, we think that planning to deal with climate change is very much like planning to accommodate seismic acti activity. When we learned that we lived in a region that was filled with earthquake faults, we didn't move away. Instead, we turned to the scientists, the planners, the architects, and the engineers and said, how do we build structures that can withstand earthquakes? I think dealing with sea level rise is going to be much the same. We know that sea level rise will continue. We just don't know exactly how fast it will rise or how high the water will get. So we need to again turn to the scientists, the engineers, the architects, the planners, and say, how do we build around a bay that will surely get bigger? Now, I think there's a lot of 
innovation that's going to take place in coming up with designs for shoreline development that are resilient. I don't know what those are, so I will show you a few examples just to stimulate your imagination. Some people have said we can deal with this by taking the San Francisco waterfront and putting Grand Canals in it so it just looks like Venice. Maybe the solution is buildings that we can easily move as the waters rise, or maybe what we need are buildings that float. Or maybe somebody will come up with something truly innovative. We need to take a hard look at whether there are some areas around the shoreline of the bay where it's more cost effective to remove existing development and to replace it with wetlands than to protect low value structures. Now tidal wetlands have to play an important role in our overall strategy because tidal wetlands are about as close as you can get to magic. They do two things. They are both sponges that soak up floodwaters and they actually sequester carbons. So they are both adaptive and mitigative. I know of no other single thing that can do both. So that's why projects like this one where the South Bay salt ponds are being restored to wetlands are so important. And this one is doubly important because it's being designed with a flood control system along the inland edge of it that will protect Silicon Valley from flooding. We need to take a very close look at low-lying areas, particularly in the Delta, that are planned for development because it may be better to abandon those plans than to allow the development to go to ahead and then try to protect it from flooding that may be inevitable no matter what we do. In order for our plan to be effective, it has to be bold and audacious. We need to stop thinking about how to restore the bay to the way it was and protect it the way it is. Instead, we need to design the bay for the way it will be in the future, when it will have different water elevations, different salinity, different chemistry, and in fact, different species. What we need to do is proactive adaptive management, where we put the conditions in place that respond the way we want when the changes that are inevitable come about. Now, at this point, somebody says, you're talking about playing God. Well, if you look at the way we have remade the bay, it's clear we've already been playing God. So the issue isn't whether or not to play God. The problem is how to get it right. At the same time we're moving on our plan, we need to work to move aggressively to reduce greenhouse gases. And we can all be proud as Californians to look at the steps we're already taking. In the Bay Area, if we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases, we face a big problem because you see, unlike the rest of the world and California, the biggest single source of air emissions in the Bay Area comes from the transportation sector. And most of that is coming out of the tailpipes of automobiles and light trucks. So we need to be developing new fuels that pollute less and new vehicles that use less fuel. But there's another way of dealing with the problem. In the Bay Area, we have lots of sprawl, whereas you see virtually everybody needs an automobile to get around. So we need to be building more higher density development so people can get around on foot, bicycle, and transit. And most of this will be built near BART stations and rail stations. But we're looking at opportunities to build transit-oriented development around new ferry terminals. We're going to have to change some of the laws we have in California, laws that work perfectly well to deal with the problems of the past, but aren't adequate to deal with the problems we're going to face in the future. Let me give you an example. I told you about the four agencies that are working together, and that kind of cooperation is essential, but it has limitations. 
Because if somebody proposes to put a new subdivision in one of those areas that I showed you is going to be underwater, none of the four agencies has the authority to say you can't do it. None of us even has the authority to say you're a damn fool, but at least you have to put up a flood wall. That authority rests with 110 local governments in the Bay Areas. All of this is going to cost us lots of money. Where we find the money is a big question. What other expenditures we're going to have to forego? Health care, education are also big questions. But fortunately, we live in a region that I think is absolutely destined to take the lead in dealing with climate change. And there are four reasons for my optimism. First, with so much low-lying land covered with expensive development, we can't ignore the problem. Second, we have a, felt, a very wealthy region. We can afford to do things differently. Third, we have a lot of innovative people living in our region, people that solve problems we didn't even know we had. And fourth, we have a history of being politically very courageous. Fifty years ago, we realized that business as usual would destroy San Francisco Bay. So we found the political courage and conviction to save the Bay. Over the next 50 years, we faced the prospect of losing some of the most important parts of the Bay Area to the Bay if we continue business as usual. Again, we have to find the political conviction and courage to do the right thing. Ignoring the problem won't make it go away. Postponing dealing with it will simply allow the problem to become more of a crisis. What we do in the Bay Area statistically is going to have a very tiny impact on what happens to our planet. But we can leverage our impact by providing ideas, innovation, leadership that can be used around the country and around the world. The challenges posed by climate change are enormous, but we have to meet the challenge. Because in every one of our futures, there's a child, a grandchild, or somebody else's child who's going to look at us and say, how could you have not seen what was happening? And why didn't you do something about it? We have to be able to look that child in the eye and honestly say, as soon as I became aware of the problem, I did everything I could to solve it. Our first step in trying to solve that problem is in your folders. It's this yellow thing. We've approached this from this, the perspective that BCDC has absolutely no responsibility to deal with sea level rise and no authority to do a damn thing about it. We could have walked away. Instead, what we said was, given those set of conditions, there's no limitation on our thinking. So what we have outlined here is, even though it's justified and has dates and numbers and so forth, is not a proposal. It is the beginning of a dialogue. It is what the four regional agencies working with local government can do. Not in it is what our federal partners can do. Uh, not in it is what the conservancy can do. And I hope that Sam will talk to us a little bit about what will happen there. Also absent is the business sector and the innovators uh, that we have here in the Bay Region. So I really welcome you looking at that proposal and getting back to us with your ideas. Are we on the right track, the wrong track? How should we change it and how can you be involved? Thank you so very much for having me here today.